One. Yes, there is one place in which you can see not only Mars and Venus, but all the other heavenly bodies. Oh, where is that, may I ask? I'm delighted you asked me that, because I'm going to show you. <laughs> There's no one else who's been Mr. Astronomy throughout all these years, except Mr. Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick Moore. He was a great conveyor of enthusiasm and enjoyment. He just happened to be that his subject was the stars. It could be that uh, somewhere in the universe, some being at this very moment is looking at a television screen and seeing... Well, good evening and welcome to the sky. <laughs> Pay attention because I've got my eye on He was a TV icon. You didn't watch the sky at night for the astronomy. Of course, you won't see Vega looking large because no telescope yet built will show a star. It's gone, point of right. Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. Patrick was a great eccentric, and he played on his eccentricity. And it's why I think he became such a household name. We have really exciting news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. Of course... People who had no interest in astronomy began to learn and become interested, and because of his own personality, they actually look forward to seeing this crazy man on TV. Good evening. Well, I'm afraid Burnham's Comet turned out to be something of a disappointment. Quite a number of people wrote in to me to say that they'd managed to see it all right, but it didn't really come up to expectations, and remember, I warned... Sir Patrick Moore was Britain's most famous astronomer. A much-loved eccentric, he was a fixture on British television since 1957. I can't incidentally resist quoting one letter. Watch from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning. Meteors from the sky, none from the wife, plenty. He inspired generations of astronomers, and I was one of them. He was also a prolific author, an accomplished musician, and a keen cricket player. I was actually hit for, for, for an 11. An 11, <laughs> yes. Wretched man hit the ball into the outfield, it went into a rabbit hole, and the fielder forgot to call lost ball. By the time it was found, they'd run 11. <laughs> Born in 1923, Patrick became hooked on astronomy at the age of six. An only child, he was educated at home due to a weak heart. And when war broke out, he lied about his age, faked a medical, and joined the RAF, serving with Bomber Command as a navigator. You were on active service in the, in the war, weren't you? Oh, well, I potted around, not doing very much. We I claimed to be the only pupil navigator who was pinpointed Bristol when he was actually over Norwich. <laughs> War changed Patrick's life in several ways. His only girlfriend was killed in an air raid shortly after they were engaged. He never married. We were both friendly. We had planned to have a son. He never got started at all. No, he no. would have been 60 now. How old was it? Yeah. I'm a bachelor. And that's why, and that really is why you're a bachelor for the oh, first Yeah. These things happen. You've got to make, make the best of a bad job. Mm. She's not there, that's, that's it. You never really got over it. Um, he said that you know there was never another woman for him, but he never wanted another relationship with a woman like that. He said you know that was that was it. That was his one love, and he didn't want another. After the war, Patrick turned down the state grant he needed to take up a place at Cambridge. Whilst working as a teacher, he pursued astronomy in his spare time. You call yourself an amateur astronomer. I think a lot of people would say that you're being unduly modest. No, not a bit of it. My only role in astronomy these days, if I've got one at all, is that I do a bit of observing here and there, uh, and I've written some stuff, and uh, all I can try and do really is to try and egg on those people who can do far better than I can. Nonetheless, in 1953, he mapped the surface of the moon to produce the most comprehensive atlas of the time. It was Patrick's uh, map which helped the Apollo astronauts um, to land on the moon. It was a guidance for the uh, Russian space program as well. And so this amateur project that had its origins in casual sketches of the, of the moon then became this shot in the arsenal for NASA and the Russian space agency to do their things. Patrick was very proud that the work that he did had this real fundamental importance in astronomy. In April 1957, 
Patrick was asked to front a new television series about astronomy, and the sky at night was born. Good evening. It was a great treat, because it was only on once a month. Mercury and Venus and Mars are all so badly placed that, to all intents and purposes, they are out of view altogether. And that Patrick had a liveliness that just wasn't on a lot of television then. Jupiter's making quite a brave show, and you can see it in the southern part of the sky late at night. You felt you were members of a sort of secret society late at night, and Patrick was the head boy <laughs> guiding us through everything. First of all, here's a globe to represent Uranus, and here's a globe to represent the Earth on the same scale. And you can see there's a very considerable difference. I have a vivid picture of Patrick staring very intensely out from the screen. And it was riveting. It was just absolutely riveting to say, you know, this is what you can see. And if you go out there, you can actually see this in the sky. Uh, Saturn never has been shown on direct television before. Of course, it is a difficult object. Uh, please don't imagine that you're going to get as large and as detailed a picture as that very fine drawing that appeared in the Radio Times because that was a drawing, and it's a very different matter indeed from getting an actual picture on the screen. There it is, yes, and there is Saturn for the first time on direct television. You can see the ring... I was fascinated by astronomy as a kid, and I think really it came from seeing Patrick on the sky at night. It awakened in me this absolute joy of looking up into the night sky, which I still have. I still have this childish awe looking at the stars, and I actually decided that rather than be a train driver, I would be an astronomer. That's really what I wanted to do most in the world, alongside music. The Sky at Night started broadcasting at the dawn of the space age. For those like myself who were children in the 1950s, space travel was something futuristic, which really uh, belonged on the cornflakes packet rather than anywhere else. Um, and of course it was the Sputnik in 1957, which made this a reality followed quickly by uh, sending up the first people into space. You know, if I'd come on the air in 1957, when we did the first of these Sky at Night programs, and said that within five years, I'd be showing you pictures of the first man to go round the Earth in orbit in a spaceship, well, I think you'd have regarded me as mad. He perhaps was born at the best time possible because he saw incredible development throughout the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. Well. Patrick Moore, what did you think of that? Quite incredible. Uh, one thing we've got to bear in mind, I think, they were magnificent pictures. I'm not going to say they show us more detail than we've got from the orbiters, but they probably do. This has been a fantastic few decades in astronomy, and um, uh, Patrick had the joy to be able to report on it all. We have a lift off, 32 minutes past the hour. The moon landing obviously was such a huge thing for Patrick because they're his moon that he's been studying in his telescope all these years. Suddenly there are people walking on it. Well, this is the moment, if there ever was a moment, for Patrick Moore. Well, I will if you'll absolutely overcome. I've lived with this idea all my life. Now that it's really happened, I can hardly believe it. No admiration can be too great for those magnificent men who have brought this strange spidery module down on the moon. And this obviously is a moment that humanity is never going to forget. I think he was rather sad, as we all were when the moon landings finished. But I remember the, a marvellous Sky at Night program that he did um, with the last man on the moon, Gene Cernan, commander of Apollo 17. And you really got a feel for what it was like to be there. What about navigational problems? Do you have any? We studied, uh, due to a great deal of your work, of course, on, uh, on the mapping of the moon, uh, we studied the area we were going to land so well that I really believe I knew it, at least from the air, from above, as well as I know my own backyard. I was rolling on the moon one day, in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May. Oh, what a nice day. Oh, funny, there's not a cloud in the sky. I think Patrick's enthusiasm and his passionate account of what was happening on the moon really added a lot to our perception. He was able to interpret that for us and make it seem real, make it uh, actually something we could understand.
The way he came over as this great enthusiast, this fast talking, this person who was bubbling for the subject, was just the same as he was in real life. He almost saw it as his role to be, if you like, the Mr. Astronomy, the man who would try and encourage new generations of people to take up an interest in his subject. He had this instinct, this sense, to pick up young people, and I was one of them, and to, to get them into astronomy, to realise their enthusiasm. And he'd sort of nurture us. Back in the 1960s, when I was about to go into a career, I couldn't work out what to do. I was a keen young amateur astronomer when I was about 10, but I'd, I'd given it all up for, you know, rock bands and boys and the usual kind of stuff you get into. Heather, let me ask you one direct question. Do you think yourself there really is a black hole in the middle of the galaxy? I won't be positive, but I do think it's the one object which at the moment fits all the observations. Well, you could be right. Let's go and look. I'm game if you are. Right. My mother actually said to me, why don't you think you'd become a professional astronomer? I said, well, I haven't a clue what to do. She said, why don't you write to Patrick Moore? Well, we told you it was like science fiction. Good night. And I wrote to him and I said, I would think of going into professional astronomy and put a PS at the end. I'm a girl. Is this a handicap? Couldn't believe he replied to me. It says from Patrick Moore, Dear Miss Cooper, many thanks for your letter. Let me assure you on one point. Being a girl is no handicap at all. I just thought that generosity of spirit was fantastic. It really urged me on to try for a career in astronomy. Does this help? Let me know. I will do everything I can to be of assistance. With all best wishes, yours sincerely, Patrick Moore. Amazing. <laughs> Patrick responded to thousands of letters on an old-fashioned typewriter, which he refused to swap for a computer. Most of the keys didn't work, drove many publishers completely berserk. You would hear the typewriter going, and probably six times out of ten he was answering letters, often um, from small boys or girls who were interested in astronomy, and he replied to them all. It was almost sacrosanct. It was something that he consistently did right up to the time when he could hardly type. When I was a schoolboy, I joined a local astronomical society and Patrick made monthly visits to the society. I was um, from a working class neighbourhood and to be able to see through the chink in the curtain to life beyond, that was something which I valued enormously. Patrick, right up to his final years, was um, enthusing young people. He never married, of course. Um, I, in many ways, we were all his family. We'd phoned him up and said, you know, we're a couple of boys at the local grammar school interested in astronomy. Can we come and look through your telescope? And he said, oh, please come down the next clear night. I was a very short lad and couldn't reach the eyepiece. And Patrick lifted me up to the telescope. And the very first thing I looked at through a telescope was the planet Saturn. And it was just so beautiful. I was just utterly transfixed. I'm walking along the rim at one of the most remarkable places in the entire world. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona, a huge gaping hole in the ground over 4,000 feet across. Just look at it. The Sky at Night was commissioned for only three programmes, but under Patrick it went on to become the world's longest running TV series with the same presenter. The reason why people watch your program is as much for you. Yeah. Oh, it is, Patrick. It's your it is your performance. Am I not right? Is it not the performance as much as what he said? Thank you. Because people are fascinated by the way that you tell them things. <laughs> now, you can't deny that. You're being modest. Patrick. No, I'm not. It so happened that when astronomy became, when I say metaphorically down to earth, and this was really in 1957 when the space age started, I was just the person who was doing it. So there I stayed. But astronomy is a fascinating subject. And if somebody else had been around at that time, they'd be on the air now and they'd be sitting here talking to you, not me. This month's sky at night is about the distances of the stars. He did fill the screen and he spoke machine gun, um, rapid, but articulate and entertaining. Will you please close one eye, doesn't matter which one, and then hold up your finger and line your finger up with my nose as you see it in the television screen. Got that all right? Now, without moving anything, use the other eye and you will see that my, your finger is no longer lined up with my nose. And if you keep everything quite still and flick your eyes around like that, you will see your finger apparently flashing to and fro.